Welcome to Bible Breath, where we dig into the Word of God to catch our breath for whatever's coming next. Today we're going to dig a bit more deeply into the topic of baptism, which we talked about at the end of the last video as we discussed the Apostle Peter's speech on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is an event that takes place in the book of Acts in chapter 2. We went into the details last time. We won't go through them again. You can go back and watch that. But it's a pretty well-known day in the history of the church, a day on which a lot of good things happened. And remember that Peter said this. He said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, telling the people that those who are baptized are forgiven. Hmm. How that happens and what it means and and who baptism is for is what we're going to talk about as we gather around the Word of God today. In particular, we're going to look at three things. Today we're going to talk about what the Bible identifies as baptism and talk about specifically what baptism is, the def definition of that, specifically what it does, what are the promises that God associates with baptism, and then finally, who should be baptized, who it's for, what it is, what it does, and who it's for. Remember that Jesus is the one who commanded baptism. In Matthew 28, he gathered with his disciples and he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and also teaching them to obey everything that God has commanded us. And so what is baptism? I'm going to read to you a section from Mark chapter 7. In Mark chapter 7, it's a, it's a couple of verses and you will not hear the word baptism. But in this section is the same word, the same word that is used for baptism, just translated differently. See if you can identify what that word is. So in Mark chapter 7, it says this. It says, The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Were you able to catch it? It's a word that popped up three times in that section. I bet you got it. Washing. Ceremonial washing. They do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. And so that's basically, that is the same word that is translated as baptize in our English Bibles. It's just translated as washing because baptism simply means to to apply water like you would when you wash something and wash something of various sizes and various different ways. The uh, cups and pitchers and kettles, it's the, it's the washing. And so baptism is to apply water in various ways. But biblical baptism is not just the application of water. Remember something Jesus said when he commanded baptism. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God commands us to baptize in the name of the triune God. Why would he do that? What does that mean? I'd like you to think of a check, like a personal check that people write out. People don't use checks quite as often anymore, but I'm going to assume for a moment that you are familiar with the concept of a check. And when you have money in your bank account and you write a check to somebody else, you are telling your bank to transfer money from your account to that person. And so in a check, you put the person's name and then you put the amount of money that you want to give to them from your checking account. But if you were just to give them the check that way, they would not be able to cash it because it would be missing something very important. It would be missing your signature. You need to sign the check to let the bank know that this is happening by your authority, that you want this to take place. And that's, in a sense, what Jesus is doing by adding on the tag that he did in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He's giving a very simple application of water, authority and power from God. He's connecting the application of water with the power and the authority of God. As if God himself is signing the check of baptism, saying, this has my authority, this has my power behind it. I'm going to pause here to address a very common question that people ask about baptism, since we're just talking about the basic definition of it. People ask related to biblical baptism, does it matter how you apply the water? It doesn't matter if you... If you sprinkle it on somebody's head or if you pour it over their head or do they have to go all the way underneath the water? And the biblical answer is no. 
the Bible never makes a command as far as how to apply the water. It's just baptism is the application of water. Uh, either one, either one is great. Sometimes when you go into churches, you find that they have baptismal fonts, which is um, kind of like a bowl in some type of setup, sometimes very fancy looking, sometimes very basic looking with water in there. And they will take that water and they will scoop it in their hand and pour it over a person's head. Sometimes churches will have a great big pool of water where the person will go into the pool and they will submerse themselves entirely under the water. And biblically, either one is great. Now, some might object to that and say, well, wasn't Jesus baptized by submersion? Some people might think that, but the Bible doesn't tell us that either. And we want to be very careful not to say anything that the Bible doesn't allow us to say. The Bible does tell us when Jesus was baptized that Jesus went, walked into the water. It doesn't say he walked in and went all the way under the water. It doesn't say he went up to his ankles or he went up to his neck or, or anything like that. It just says he walked into the water and John the Baptist, he baptized, he baptized Jesus. In addition, if we look in the early history of the Christian church, you know, so the, the Christians who were practicing Christianity most in the time most closely connected to the time of Jesus and the commands that he gave, we see that they were baptizing in a variety of ways. As that some will go down to the river, like Jesus did, and be baptized in the water, maybe going all the way under, but maybe not. But then there were also um, there are also places that still exist that show us that they were baptizing with, uh, with bowls of water and either taking that water and scooping it in their hands and pouring it over somebody's head, or they were placing the people in the bowl of water in a, to, a certain, to a certain degree, and kind of like you would place a baby in a bath and pouring the water over them, over them in that way. But finally, the Bible doesn't define a particular way of applying the water. It's not like one is better than the other. Baptism is simply the applying of water in a wide variety of ways. So that's the basic definition of what biblical baptism is. It's the applying of water in various ways in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But what does baptism do? In general, it does exactly what God says it does. <laughs> what does God say that it does when you baptize someone? Well, go back to the day of Pentecost and remember what Peter said. We'll start there. He said, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Again, those who are baptized, they are forgiven of all their sins. And other passages talk about it in, in various ways too to kind of complete what, what Peter said or describe it in complementary ways that help us get a better appreciation for, for, what Peter, for what Peter said there. One of those takes place in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 22. He says, well, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away. Wash your sins away. In baptism, God washes away your sins. And how many, you might ask? Well, all of them. Your ones from the past and your ones from in the future. All of them. And this helps us understand maybe why God chose to use water for, uh, for baptism, because we use water to wash the dirt off any number of things, off of off of plates and dishes and cups and you know different things like that. Also, our bodies, we uh, we use water to to wash dirt off the outside. But baptism is the way of God washing our insides, our hearts. He washes away all of your sins. This is also why the Bible never speaks about someone being baptized twice. Just take note of that. That your one baptism. As mentioned just a few moments ago, it covers all sins. It washes away all sins. All the sins that you have created up until that moment. All the sins that you have committed up until that moment. And all the sins you will ever commit. The ones that you knew about in your past and the ones that you were ignorant of. The ones that you will recognize in the future. And the ones that you will entirely miss. Baptism washes away all of them. This is why Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. You are saved when you are baptized because if you are baptized and washed clean, then there are no sins on your record. And then therefore God sees no reason to keep you out of his heaven and out of his family. Those who are baptized are saved. This is why the apostle Peter in 
First Peter chapter three said, using Noah's Ark as an illustration, he said, in Noah's Ark, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. But, but this water that saved Noah and his family, that symbolizes baptism. It was a picture of baptism that was coming. Baptism, Peter says, that now saves you. You can say that baptism saves a person. Not like a magic spell or a magic chant or, you know, or something like that. It, it saves us because baptism, according to what the Bible says about it, does something really significant. It connects us with something significant. In Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? For we are united with him in a death like his. And if we were, then we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. In Galatians chapter 3, it says, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Baptism, according to the Bible, connects a person with the work of Jesus on their behalf. That's what God promises. How does that happen? Well, remember that faith is taking God at his word. And so we don't need to entirely understand how it happens. We just need to know that that's what God promises does happen. And that's what God's word says that baptism does. It connects us. It connects an individual with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so we baptize. It also clothes us with Christ. I mean, just imagine you go outside on a rainy day and you go playing in the mud. Your clothes are going to get dirty. And you're going to come in and someone might say, boy, your clothes are filthy. You should change your clothes. You should take a shower. You should wash yourself. You should take a bath. You should do something. And let's imagine that you do. You take the clothes off and you wash yourself up and now you're not dirty anymore. And you put new clothes on that aren't dirty and now, now you're clean. We do that with our bodies. That passage from Galatians says that baptism does the same thing to your soul, to your heart. Our hearts that are dirty and filthy from conception. But by baptism, God washes all the dirtiness away. And he replaces the dirty clothes with the clean clothes, the perfect clothes of Jesus. That's what baptism does. And again, not just for your life up until the moment you are baptized, but for your entire life. So that's what baptism is. That's what it does. And finally, who is it for? Like, who should we baptize? Well, Jesus answered that too. When he said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. <laughs> so Jesus commanded us very simply to go out and baptize all nations, whatever nation they're in. Did he, no age restrictions, no, no gender restrictions, no nationality restrictions, just, just all nations, everybody. And some pause there and they ask, well, or at least a common question that comes up with baptism is, well, even, even like the little, little people in the nations, the little babies and well, yeah, Jesus didn't exclude them. And notice in Peter's speech on Pentecost, he even included them. You know, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. This promise of baptism, it's for you and for your children, for all who are far off. You know, Peter applies the promise of baptism to children. The Bible never restricts baptism simply to adults. In fact, consider also Jesus' words to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He shared with Nicodemus a very important spiritual truth that we've covered in previous lessons about every soul's need for spiritual birth from the, from the very beginning of their existence. In John chapter 3, Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus, a, a member of the Sanhedrin. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Jesus is reminding Nicodemus that that spiritual birth is the work of God, the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's why baptism is identified as a means of grace. And remember what that definition is. The means of grace are the ways by which the Holy Spirit applies God's universal grace to our individual souls. And all the blessings that we've talked about so far related to baptism are gifts of God's grace to our souls. The gift of forgiveness of sins, the gift of a new spiritual life, the gift of salvation. You can say that those who are baptized are saved. Those are the spiritual gifts, but now work backwards from the reception of those gifts. So a person receives these spiritual benefits because they have faith. We talked about that in a previous lesson. They have faith only because the Holy Spirit created faith. We also talked about that in a previous lesson. 
The Bible connects both of those things, the spiritual benefits of baptism and spiritual birth with the act of baptism. And so we baptize believing that baptism creates faith that receives these spiritual blessings. We baptize believing that baptism creates faith, faith that receives those spiritual blessings. And that's where some will pause again and say, well, hold on a second. Babies can't have faith, so we should not baptize. But two things there. Firstly, the Bible never says that babies can't have faith. There's no passage in the Bible that even alludes to that. And so we have to be very careful that we're not saying something that the Bible doesn't say, or, or we're not taking things out of context, or, but the Bible doesn't say that babies can't have faith in Jesus. In fact, Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, he even talked about those little ones. And the, use the, word for, the word he used for little ones was the littlest ones. And he said, these little ones who believe in me. Even Jesus saw faith, saving faith, in the hearts of little babies. I want to tell you two stories, neither of which are in the Bible, <laughs> but stories that relate, I think, to what we're talking about here. First one is with my daughter, my oldest daughter. When my oldest daughter was born, she, uh, she loved her mommy and daddy, and she still does. She's, uh, she's not a little baby anymore. But she loved her mommy and daddy so much that she would only let her mommy and daddy hold her. And she would not allow anyone else to hold her. And the way that she would object, even as a little baby, like nearly, nearly newborn and for the next many months after that, um, is that when anyone else tried to hold her, she would start to scream very, very violently. She could tell when mommy and daddy were holding her. She and like if somebody else, if grandpa or grandma tried to <laughs> tried to hold their 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 grandchild, the grandchild would scream very, very violently until either I or my wife would would take our daughter and hold on to her. And and then she would know that mommy and daddy were holding her and she would stop screaming. And then if we tried to pass her off to somebody else, then she would start screaming again. And she did this for a very, very long time. So our little daughter, at a very young age, was able to recognize who her mommy and daddy were. Now, she was not able to say the words, that's my mommy, or that's my daddy. But she knew. You know, how did she know? From, uh, from the time she spent in the womb, you know, hearing, hearing the voices, from the time she spent at home, just getting, getting familiar, she, was, she became very comfortable with those relationships, and, and she loved them, and she treasured them. Most importantly, as what we're talking about here, she recognized them. Now, little babies do not have the ability like adults do to say, that's my God. That's who I believe. Let me tell you about him. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. No. But that doesn't mean they can't have faith or know God. And baptism, in a sense, the way the Bible talks about it, is a way that God can introduce himself to someone and say, hello, I am your God. And here is your Savior. It's good to have you in the family. How God does that? I don't know, but babies, they can believe. They can have faith. And they need faith. And so it's a blessing that God gives us baptism, a way by which faith can be created, faith that receives all those spiritual blessings. Second story I want to tell you is about another one of my daughters on the day of her baptism. She was, uh, she was very young few days, few weeks old. We brought her to the front of the church. She was wearing a very nice dress and she was closing her eyes, just a happy, peaceful little child. And then it was time to baptize. It was my very first baptism that I ever did. Um, so very, very meaningful. But they leaned her over the font. It was the font of water, like, like the bowl, and there was water in it. And and so I scooped water into my hand and I poured it over my daughter's head and I said, I said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And my daughter kept her eyes closed the whole time, just a peaceful, peaceful little child getting baptized. And as soon as I said, in the name of the Holy Spirit, keeping her eyes closed, she just raised her fist in the air, just <laughs> and put her fist down again. <laughs> Like she was celebrating. 
that something special had just happened. The Bible doesn't tell us to expect the uh, the raised fist in the air, you know, like uh, uh, the peaceful the peaceful joy that comes with with being baptized. But but it was a neat way for me to start my ministry, my very first baptism to to see in a visible way what you know what God promises is happening in the act of baptizing. Sins washed away. All sins forgiven. Spiritual birth taking place. Salvation. In our next video, we'll we'll dig into one of those a bit more deeply, talking about what it means to live every day with the fact that you are baptized. There's some great benefits to our everyday living, even though it's just a one-time thing. There's some great benefits God wants us to live with. Look forward to seeing you then.